It's the show where Hawaii's newsmakers come to talk and to take your questions live. From the nation's capital to Honolulu Hale, from the state legislature to the fifth floor, we bring the experts to you and ask them what you want to know. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Palaisuji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long Strugs. Aloha, happy Monday. Thanks so much for starting your week off with us. I'm Yenji Denise, joined by Ryan Kalei Suji, and this is Spotlight Hawaii. And Ryan, today we are heading over to the Hawaii State Capitol. That's right. We are catching up with someone who has spent some time on the uh, third and fourth floor of the legislature and now finds herself on the fifth floor as lieutenant governor. And joining us this morning is... Lieutenant Governor Sylvia Lu, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Aloha, Yanji. Aloha, Ryan. Uh, uh, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having uh, Thanks for being here. You know, as I mentioned, uh, you have spent uh, a lot of your career as a legislature. So I want to dump, jump into what you think is uh, how things are going this legislative session. Of course, this time you are on the fifth floor, seeing how things are uh, unfolding during the legislative session. Uh, your thoughts about the new position and role that you find yourself in and the perspective that you have now as Lieutenant Governor viewing how this session is going? Uh, you know, now it's at a point where, um, you know, my office and uh, even me, I have to go down to the legislature, uh, make a case for our funding requests, uh, do a good job in uh, making sure that all of our requests and all of our documents are in order. But it's been great, you know, coming from the legislature, we have, um, we, and as finance chair, we already came with um, some knowledge of how state government works and having the relationship really helps. And, uh, you know, coming, uh, coming, going into a hearing and then you see them um, welcoming you. It's been so terrific to be able to uh, interface with, both the public and the legislature. You've, uh, you know, you've obviously witnessed what we've seen, which is that not all the cabinet nominees have fared uh, as well as the governor would have liked. On this program and others, he's called for more civility in how his cabinet nominees are being treated. Do you think that your former colleagues are giving the cabinet nominees a fair shake? Uh, you know, I've been through many governors. Um, you know, I've been in the legislature for about 24 years. So I've been through uh, the Cayetano years, the Lingo years, Abercrombie years, um, uh, Governor Ige, and now Governor Josh Green. Um, it, I would have to say every governor had um, hopes of every single one of the cabinets and nominees going through the Senate. And I would say, you know, not every governor had the um, uh, a situation where um, all of the nominees went through. In fact, uh, if you look at the, the nominees this year, I think the Senate, I, the, the legislature and the Senate, that's their job to correctly vet and make sure that uh, you put um, nominees and you put directors and um, deputies through a uh, um, a series of questions and it's their job to vet. Uh, in the beginning of session, um, we, I think there was some consensus that the person that might have had the toughest job was Don Chang um, because DNR is really a hard position and there was some uh, outside opposition, but she was able to do a really good job at the budget hearings and at the confirmation hearings and building that trust and relationship with the Senate. And um, you saw the fruits of that work um, and she passed the committee unanimously. Uh, similar thing with Sharon Hurd, who is the Department of Ag um, director nominee. She also passed with flying colors. So I think there's a lot of concentrations on the ones that have gotten rejected. But when you look at the, the significant number of nominees that are going through the process and have been um, either confirmed or passing committees, I think you have to look at the entire picture as opposed to just a few ones. And just when you talk about this process, obviously, this is to ensure that the governor can create a cabinet and create people to lead the department so that things can continue to move forward. In your perspective, uh, if you are in on those cabinet meetings, how much of this is creating any obstacles for moving departments forward? Are there decisions that need to be made uh, within these departments that are potentially being held back 
because of the fact that some of these nominees are not being confirmed? Yeah, you know, um, departments and states work have to uh, they have to continue regardless of who the directors are. And a lot of times um, some of these projects have been ongoing. These are not new projects and the priorities of the governor this year uh, remain, continue to remain to be homeless and housing um, and many other projects, including mental health. And those projects are uh, continuing to be carried on by not just the directors, but many people in state government. You know, sticking with politics, and of course, we'll get to policy in a moment because I know that's why you're with us this morning. But I do want to ask you uh, to address some of the criticisms that have been lev leveled at uh, UH President David Lassner. Uh, we've seen some back and forth as to whether or not he's doing a good job. Um, the governor seems to think so. Uh, some senators obviously do not. What are your thoughts on the UH president's performance up until this point? Uh, you know, as uh, when I was in the legislature, I had a um, really good relationship with President Lasner and many times he has come to me for assistance and help and, and to really set the stage for some of the discussions for how the university can play a role not just in our um, not just specifically on university university policies but they've assisted us um, during COVID um, when we were struggling as a state on how to do contact tracing you know how to um, deal with uh, the health crisis, we turn to the university. Um, even um, in the middle of the Red Hill situation, we're turning to the university for their scientific experience and um, their knowledge. Uh, we have never had a university president who has been so active uh, in the past. Some of the presidents were criticized for not being at the Capitol enough and not um, not being um, intimately involved in many of the decisions. What you see in David Lasner is completely different. I mean, regardless of the criticism, he's here all the time and, uh, and because he knows that that's his role. And I have never had a president who both see the importance of the upper campus and lower campus. And what I mean by that, he fights for academic excellence, but at the same time, he is probably the biggest UH Rainbow fan. And I'm sure Ryan, every time you go and um, go to a volleyball game and you're broadcasting, you always see the president there. And I, I've been to a um, few um, basketball games and others as well, and he's always there. And he is somebody who truly cares about the university and cares about improving the system. With that said, with any position, even for me, uh, whether you're the governor, lieutenant governor, any leading position will come with criticism, but through that criticism, what do you do with that criticism is the key, you know? Um, even for me, you know, you look at criticism as a way to improve and always self-reflect and, uh, as long as it's productive, um, you know, I think it comes with the job. Well, one of the things that uh, during the campaign season and even in our initial uh, conversations when you first came into office, uh, one of the roles that you thought would be critical, for, especially for you with your experience, is being that liaison between the governor and the legislature, especially mm -hmm. right now as the budget is being formed. Uh, there continues to be negotiations about some of the efforts and some of the measures that the governor would like to see uh, move forward on, including uh, his tax incentives and so, so forth. How involved are you uh, in this process? Are you uh, speaking to the legislatures, the, you know, the leadership in both houses, and, and are you able to be that liaison uh, so far that uh, you, know, you thought would be one of your strengths coming into this role? Yeah, um, I am constantly uh, in communication with um, uh, key legislators, and in fact, not even just um, the committee chairs, the members as well. And I appreciate all the work that they do, and they know that I appreciate it because I've been in their shoes, and they go through uh, really challenging issues. Um, I was so proud that the, the legislature was able to quickly address the um, reproductive freedom bill. And I know it was controversial to some, but you know they, they were able to dispose of that uh, issue. And I helped um, deal with some of the, the, uh, the, 
the I think the some of the advocacy discussions and some of the other things that came up and um, I really uh, love my role as that liaison. I really value it. I value the relationship between the governor and the legislature and any way that I can do to help fulfill that. You know, I think that's what gives this administration strength. Let's talk about one of the things that you're focused on, and that is the Ready Keiki initiative, just to catch folks up to speed. Where are you in that process? And, you know, there's there's wide agreement that we need to have more preschool access for, for kids in our community. How soon do you see some of these classrooms starting to open? Yeah, no, a really terrific question. Um, you, you know, uh, when I was in high school, um, uh, I heard... Um, prior leaders and um, prior superintendents talking about how we needed universal pre-K or universal access by year 2000. And I always tell people the year 2000 came and went about 23 years ago. And so it, it is really uh, a social equity issue. It's a um, social justice issue because the individuals who can't afford to send their preschool um, to kids to preschool are doing it now. So it's those individuals who cannot afford to send their kids to preschool who are not able to do it. A lot of times it's, it's two things. It's either cost prohibitive or it's not convenient. And so one of the things that we're looking at is that we are doing a data-driven analysis of where the preschool should go. And I think at one of the, um, one of the conversation Yanji and I had, um, in a, uh, another show was the importance of really placing preschools close to work areas. Um, I have a situation where we opened public preschools in remote areas and those were never filled only because when public preschool is only open from eight to 2.15 um, on um, certain days and sometimes on Wednesdays at 1.30. And if you're a working mother uh, or working parent, it will be really difficult for you to drive about an hour to Eva or wherever it is and then pick up your kid at 1.30 and then um, provide a safe place where your child can go. So because of that model we're looking at, is it better to have preschools close to work centers, close to work areas? Yeah, and let's maybe expand a little bit more about that. I mean, how would that, um, you know, would that necess would that mean that more funding and efforts are going to go into the urban core? Uh, and, and how is that going to be distinguished? What communities within uh, the metropolitan area, if you will, of Honolulu, how is that going to be decided where these uh, would be established first? The good thing about this program, the Ready Kiki program, is we already got $200 million from the legislature last year. And I work with uh, many of the legislators to make sure that we have the construction funding. Out of the $200 million, we are looking at um, number one, Title I schools. Um, number two, uh, where are uh, some of the areas that we can tackle um, social economic um, issues? So even if we might be building in an urban core, we will continue to service individuals who are in the rural areas, who are in the um, um, remote areas, um, depending on where they work. So we're also tracking um, where people are working, um, where they're planning to send their kids to school. So it will be a lot of data driven. One of the things we're very excited about is we will be launching a web portal where parents and uh, potential um, uh, guardian of a preschooler can track exactly where the preschools will be opening. And that will be part of our outreach. And it will be doing a significant amount of outreach and assistance to have them register for the preschools that are either whether it's um, close to where they live or close to where they work. So that will be another segment of this Ready KT program, which will help in the successful implementation of this program. So let's let's walk through the practical level of that because I know as a parent, um, you basically, you get assigned based on your zip code. That's, that's right. your school, it's your neighborhood school. That's traditionally how it's done in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So take your EVA example. Let's say you live in EVA, but you work in town. How would you get access to that town preschool? Do you have to file something through your employer to get some kind of exemption? How does that on a practical level actually work? 
Right. So even as a regular um, K to 12 education, if you can justify you work in town and it's more convenient, then you can have um, uh, what's known as a general exception. And for preschool, I think we'll be looking at um, uh, looking at that situation even more. So uh, I, I, even through the K to 12 regular education, there are um, exemptions that are provided. Um, but we're very excited that um, from the money that we received um, last year, $200 million, we are about to open up 11 schools in August of this year, even for state government and even for myself, who is a, you know, who is a stickler when it comes to accountability and transparency. I'm very, um, I'm just so pleased that we were able to work with all the departments and stakeholders to open up 11 after we received funding just last year. And if we can speak, of course, this is not a program that's going to be confined to the island of Oahu. This is a statewide initiative. Uh, if you can sp exactly. speak about the neighbor island uh, expansion and how they will play into this rollout overall. Yeah, absolutely. So out of the 11, um, it, we have one on Kauai, I believe two on Maui, I believe also two on the big island. So we will be concentrating where um, people do not have preschool access first. And of course, in urban Honolulu, there would be a lot of um, preschools existing already. So we will be also going out to the rural areas, um, neighbor islands, um, areas where people don't have access. So we are looking at working with charter schools about opening up preschools um, in different areas and um, and close to work sites as well. You know, of course, the, the physical classroom is one aspect. It's also staffing that is the other challenge. We know the DOE already has a, a relatively large teacher shortage. Where are you looking to find the teachers to staff these 11 classrooms and beyond? Um, wh where are the workers? Yeah, the interesting thing is when we took a look at the workforce, uh, the teacher shortage is really occurring at the high school level or subject matter and not so much at the elementary school level. One of the things that we found was that in order to get a preschool degree at the University of Hawaii, you need a dual credit. So you need to be a preschool pre-K to third grade degree, plus you also have to double major in uh, K to eighth grade education, which has made the, the preschool degree really rigorous. So one of the conversations that we had and the University of Hawaii is willing to take on is separate out and then have a preschool alone degree, which will have a lot more um, students who are interested um, participate in this pathway. The other thing that we're looking at is looking at high schools through our early college program um, we will be opening, potentially opening high, uh, preschools at high school sites so that it will provide not just a preschool program, but a teaching pathway for some of these kids who can potentially graduate from high school with an AA associate degree to be able to go into some of these classrooms as a teacher assistant right away. Yeah, and that brings up a question that we have from some of our audience members. Heidi's asking if you put any thought into leaning uh, on college campuses to promote early education and giving teachers, uh, teaching students experience before it hits the workforce. Uh, has any attention been or thought been given to how college campuses might play into this and the workforce maybe development of some of the class, uh, those opportunities that exist with college students? Yeah, absolutely. So in addition to high schools, we have spoken to the University of Hawaii system, and we are planning to build a preschool at every University of Hawaii campus so that it not only serve as a preschool for um, the students and the community, it will be a teaching pathway at all the universities. So we're very excited about the potential of having preschools on every university campuses. That is exciting. Okay, well, we'll keep tracking those. That ele those 11 classrooms are great news mm -hmm. and we'll keep, I'm sure every time we have you on, we'll be talking yeah. about this one. Um, I wanna widen out just to the office. You've been obviously in the job for several months now. You know, you're familiar as we noted at the top with that building in and out, but what has been the biggest surprise for you in coming into the role of LG now that you've really, uh, you know, had, had your foot on the ground, if you will, for some time? Yeah. 
That's a really good question. One of the things that I've noticed right away was uh, coming from finance and coming from the legislature, the legislature has strived to be um, paperless and strive to make sure that uh, you know, things are categorized either through email or scanning. Um, the LG's office and probably the rest of the state is, uh, or state departments is still very paper-based. And so we get um, administrative rules through the fax and the legislature has not used a fax machine in years. And I can't imagine um, there are people out there still using fax machines to send assignments to our office. So the amount of paper that is generated within the, this office is uh, is not something that we've been used to at the legislature. I think that speaks of how in order for state government to be functioning at a point where we are um, we are accountable to the public and to make it user friendly for our constituents, we have to be ahead of the times and we have to pivot and transform ourselves so that we are responsive in a way that is being um, is being recognized by the general public. So we are looking at revamping our internal system and how we can go paperless, how we can uh, communicate um, more efficiently through emails and through um, different types of technology. It's hard to believe that uh, those <laughs> things are still happening at the Capitol yeah. and there are some uh, pretty antiquated uh, also resources there that that are continuing mm -hmm. to be need to be updated updated so uh, we'll also be keeping track on that uh, one of the other things that uh, has always been an interesting dynamic is the relationship between the lieutenant governor and the governor uh, in in years past we know that there have been some uh, disagreements between what's happening on the mm -hmm. fifth floor uh, how have things been with the governor uh, and your working relationship how often are you meeting and how involved are you in some of the decisions that are also being made there uh, at the state capitol by the governor yeah, uh, you know, he and I communicate all the time. In fact, just uh, this morning, he texted me just to check in and go, hey, how's it going? And then over the weekend, we we're um, joking about April Fool's because, you know, um, you know, you probably know Josh is a huge, um, but a huge jokester. So, you know, any chance he get to poke fun at um, somebody and then, you know, play a joke, you know, he's going to jump on it. So uh, April Fool's, I mean, he he did a really good one and then he texted me about something and I was like, okay, is that true or not? And then he waited a little bit and then he said April Fool's. And I told him, okay, before you text all these random individuals, because this is like, you know, you're going to go off and just play a joke on Ryan and um, Yunji and whoever it is, just check with me because some things may not be completely, uh, you know, people might believe it and you might cause problems only because you are the governor, but he and I get along really well. You know, there are a lot of stressors in this job and um, he's handling it uh, really well. And um, I'm involved in his cabinet meetings um, every Wednesday and we talk all the time and he's bouncing off ideas and I bounce off ideas with him. Yeah, you know, and and in that in that role, I wonder, given you know the challenges that we talked about off the top, um, having to be that broker and going back and forth, I, how much of of your time do you think that you're spending really advocating for the administration's priorities? And you know, and and like when you look at the division of labor for your job, how much of your job really is serving in that role and trying to advocate for the administration and its priorities? And how much of it is it doing all the other work that we talked about earlier as well? Right. It, you know, it's it's always about managing um, your time. And, uh, you know, you only have so many, um, so much time in a day. And one of the other things that I found really um interesting about this job was I had no idea because it's still the lieutenant governor's office, you know, the governor's office has a lot of public interface, but the lieutenant governor's office has a significant amount of public interface as well. Uh, I just came back from um, Maui this weekend because I had to give a talk to a group the prior weekend. I was in Naalehu, then went to Maui and then came back. I love the public interface part because it's my way to engage and then ask, answer questions. You know, a lot of times um, people don't really get to um, see their public officials and they have this uh, 
you know, they're, um, they're thinking, okay, you know, if I saw somebody, I want to ask this question, and I want to be available. So, um, but be, in addition to the, the public interface, and, you know, getting out there in the community, uh, I still need to go and talk to the legislature and um, stress the importance of many of the legislation that's uh, moving and also, you know, help in guiding, um, setting the relationship between not just um, between the administration and the legislature, sometimes it's between legislators as well. So it's a lot of work, but I love this job. And, you know, I'm just so thankful that, um, that the people gave me this opportunity to be here. You know, I quickly want to ask you, as someone who has worked on the state budget and knows it pretty well mm -hmm. and intimate, uh, all those fine details that go into that, uh, there has been some criticism by those who are managing the budget this year. Uh, on the Senate side, of course, Ways and Means Chair um, De La Cruz, and then on the House side as well. As someone who, uh, which is Rep. Yamashita, as someone that has worked through this dynamics of having to find that negotiation, because oftentimes there is a, a lot of differences be that exist between both budgets. How do you think things are going with the budget formation thus far and the relationship between these two chairs uh, that are critical during this time uh, and will play a more critical role as we head down into conferencing? I have a lot of confidence in Chair Yamashita. I also have a lot of confidence in Je Chair De La Cruz. It's hard being um, of the money chair. Um, regardless of what happens, you're always going to get blamed for a passage of a bill or non-passage of a bill. And you also get blamed for um, something being funded and something not being funded. It, it, you know, Having been finance chair for 10 years, I know how hard it is. And... Um, we're going into crunch time. The next several weeks will be when they will they will start their negotiations. And uh, you know, I wish them a lot of luck. Um, I I have so much aloha for um, these gentlemen and all the others as well. You know, you have the CIP chairs, um, uh, Gil Agaran from Maui, um, uh, Scott Nishimoto on Oahu, Lisa Kitagawa. You know, they're doing they're working. Um, hard um and they're always there on the weekends as well so i i appreciate them so much yeah actually i'm curious to know because i know that um as we mentioned throughout this conversation just given your experience you know also the confirmation process and mm -hmm. have you been involved with the nominees in trying to help prepare them kind of giving them a, a sense of what kind of questions might be asked or how they might handle the personalities of different lawmakers how much of of that work are you doing yeah so um there have been um, directors and nominees who reached out to me and anyone who reaches out, I, um, you know, give them advice and I, I talk to senators or others, um, advocacy groups on their behalf and, uh, and going through any confirmation, it's, it's such a stressful job and stressful part. So I text them just to guide them to make sure that they can breathe and, you know, they, um, they see it as this is just the one hump that they need to go through. And so I've been involved with just providing um, them guidance and comfort at times. And um, I think at the end of the day, we're going to see a great group of people who will help us lead the state. All right. Well, we are unfortunately all out of time, but we want to thank you, uh, Lieutenant Governor Sylvia Lu, for joining us this morning and updating us uh, on all the things that you're working on there at the Hawaii State Capitol. And uh, we look forward to Many more conversations in the future. Thanks so much for starting your week off with us. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Well, great mix there, Ryan, of the politics and the policy that we were able to address with her today. We started off talking about some of the challenges the administration has seen when it comes to getting confirmation uh, of their cabinet nominees through. Um, she really sort of balanced that message saying, yes, there were some challenges, but look at all the folks who did make it through so far, uh, really taking an upbeat and positive note uh, and, and kind of sharing a little bit of the inside baseball at the end there saying, you know, uh, she texts with them. If they reach out to her, she offers advice. And, and really, she is taking this role of being sort of the mediator on all fronts. Uh, you know, we, we thought that we were going to see that through the campaign. That was something that was talked about. And we are now really seeing that in action. Yeah. And also just a relationship with the legislature as they move through this critical portion uh, of the legislative process as, as they head into conferencing. Uh, but you heard from her the confidence that she has in both uh, finance chair and the WAM chair about them being able to come to agreement. Of course, as someone who has 
uh, served in that role for 10 years. She is someone that intimately knows the state budget uh, and how those dynamics have to work out. You heard from her saying that you will get blamed for a bill. Uh, they will get blamed for not money not going there. It's a lot of responsibility that often comes with that role and a lot of criticism as well. Uh, so she is also assuming that role of someone that can help to negotiate and help to push forward some of Governor Green's initiatives. Uh, there have been some things that the governor initially had campaigned on uh, and that had wanted to move forward, but it has altered uh, and has changed and shifted the uh, has shifted through this legislative process. Uh, but the lieutenant governor also saying that she is someone that is involved in that process, that she speaks to lawmakers, uh, has helped to negotiate things, lawmaker between lawmaker as well, and the relationship that she has with the governor that she says continues to exist uh, through weekly meetings and, and almost daily talks with what's happening uh, over there at the Capitol. Yeah, it does sound like they're getting along quite well in the thing. I'm curious to know what the April Fool's joke was. Um, we'll have to ask him about that the next time he's on. She also updated us on the progress of Ready Cakey, which is really uh, the the thing that she has uh, been tasked with, the initiative she's been tasked with, that and broadband to shepherd through. Um, and so she did say that they are opening 11 classrooms this August or you know, trying to roll these out over the next few years to try to get as many kids into seats, into classrooms classrooms and preschools as possible. And an interesting shift there with where these classrooms will go. It, previously, the focus really is in the residential areas. But now she says she's they're looking at workflow patterns and seeing where it's most convenient. If the preschool day is only 8 to 2 or 2.30 or even on some days 1.30, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to drop your child off and then commute and then have to commute back, perhaps making a lot more sense to commute together, drop off together and then drive home together. So they're really trying to alter the pattern to fit how people live in this day and age. So interesting to hear about that. Um, and she's also working to modernize the office. Yeah, just some of the things that she says, uh, you know, information is still coming through on fax machines. Uh, I didn't even know people still send fax, but obviously <laughs> uh, something that she's working to do is upgrade uh, the, what the processing of what's happening, what happens in, in the lieutenant governor's office, as well as overall state administration, and, and trying to get technology to be up to date with what's uh, a normal process and procedure that may sometimes take things back uh, and, and make things a little more difficult or cumbersome for their, uh, so just working on the efficiency overall of how the office is managed. So always great catching up with her. We want to encourage you if you've missed any portion of the interview this morning with the Lieutenant Governor that you can go back and watch us on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser later today. Get at us a podcast or uh, watch rebroadcast of this interview on Channel 50 later this evening as well. On uh, Wednesday, we'll be switching gears and catching up with Steve Alm. That's right. Honolulu prosecutor Steve Alm, always a lot to talk about with him about law enforcement. We also want to ask him about that incident that happened in February, the hit and run of that McKinley High School student. We understand that the person accused of, of uh, being involved in that incident had 164 traffic violations. How, you know, that person is still able to get onto the road. Are there things that the prosecutor's office uh, could have done? Are there other things that should be done moving forward to try to keep repeat offenders off the roads? So we're going to ask him about that. Plus, of course, get an update on Waikiki, Chinatown, and all the things that we usually discuss with the prosecutor. We always have plenty to ask him, and we do hope you'll join us right here at 1030 on Wednesday. We'll see you then. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs.